Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise and joy, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust that you are growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus each and every day and in greater levels of obedience unto him. Now, we're continuing our study through the book, Love Not the World by Watchman Nee. And today we are in chapter six. Now, Jesus told us that obviously we live in a dark world, and yet we are to be lights unto the world in which we live. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Chapter six is titled, Lights in the World. And so let's begin in chapter six, which again is entitled, Lights in the World. Without fear of challenge, Jesus could say, I am the light of the world. He said this in John chapter eight, verse 12. Now his claim does not surprise us in the least. What is surprising, however, is that he should then say to his disciples, and so by implication say to us, ye are the light of the world. He said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. For he does not exhort us to be that light, he is that light. He plainly says that we are the world's light, whether we bring our illumination out into places where men can see it or hide it away from them. The divine life planted in us, which itself is so utterly foreign to the world all around it, is a light source designed to illuminate to mankind the world's true character by emphasizing through contrast its inherent darkness. In other words, what Watchman Nee is saying here is that because we are the light of the world and because the world itself is in such darkness, the light should shine ever so brightly and even more so be recognized by others even more. It would kind of be like if you were standing in a dark room, pitch black, and someone turned on a flashlight. The light would be the most evident thing in that room because the darkness is so deep. It's so intense. And so we, as the people of God, as the followers of the Lord Jesus, who is the true light of the world, we too should be so evident in such a dark world in which we live. Well, now back to Watchman Nee. Accordingly, Jesus goes on by saying, even so, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. From this it is clear that to separate ourselves from the world today and thus deprive it of its only light in no way glorifies God. It merely thwarts his purpose in us and in mankind. Now, it is true that, as we saw earlier, the career of John the Baptist was rather different. He did, in fact, withdraw from the world to live austerely in desert places apart, subsisting, we are told, on locust and wild honey. Men went out there to seek him, for even there he was a burning and a shining light. Yet we are reminded that he was not that light. He came only to bear witness to the true light. His testimony was the last and greatest of an old prophetic order, but it was so because it pointed to Jesus. Jesus alone was the true light which lighteth every man coming into the world. And he certainly was in the world, not outside of it. You'll find this in John chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. Christianity derives from Jesus. God can use a John crying in the wilderness, but he never intended his church to be a select company living by the principle of abstinence. 
Earlier, we saw how abstinence, when we were told, handle not, nor taste, nor touch, we saw that this was merely one more element in the world system, and as such, was itself suspect. You'll remember we read this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 21. But we must go a stage further than this, and once again, the Apostle Paul comes to our help. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, he shows how the Christian life is something removed altogether from controversy about what we can and what we cannot do. He told us the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, not, that is to say, to be conceived in those terms at all. But instead, the kingdom of God, which certainly lives within us, is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, which are in a realm completely different. The Christian lives and is guided not by rules specifying just how far he may mix with men, but by these inward qualities which are mediated to him by God's Holy Spirit. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It may be good for a moment to direct our attention to the second of these. For peace, we find, is a potent element in God's answer to his son's prayer that he would keep us from the evil one, which is recorded for us in John chapter 17, verse 15. In God himself, there is a peace, a profound undisturbedness of spirit which keeps him untroubled and undistressed in the face of unspeakable conflict and contradiction. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but in me you will have peace. This again is in John 16, 33. How easily we get troubled as soon as something goes wrong. But do we ever pause to consider what went wrong with the great purpose upon which God had set his heart? God, who is light, had an eternal plan. Causing light to shine out of darkness, he designed this world to be the arena of that plan. Then Satan, as we know, stepped in to thwart God, so that men came back to love darkness rather than light. Yet in spite of that setback, the implications of which we appreciate all too little, God preserves in himself a quiet, undisturbed peace. It is that peace of God which Paul tells us is to garrison our hearts and thoughts in Christ Jesus. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. Now what does garrison really mean? It means that my foe has to fight through the armed guard at the gates before he can reach me. Before I can be touched, the garrison itself has first to be overcome. So I dare to be as peaceful as God, for the peace that is keeping God is keeping me. This is something that the world knows nothing about. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you, John 14, 27. How utterly men failed to understand Jesus. Whatever he did was wrong in their eyes, for the light that was in them was darkness. They even dared to identify the spirit that was in him with Beelzebub the prince of devils. Yet when they accused him of gluttony and drunkenness, what was his response? Jesus merely said, Father, I thank thee. Matthew chapter 11, verses 19 and verse 25. Jesus was unmoved because in spirit he abode in the peace of God. If you will recall that last night before his passion, Everything seemed to be going wrong. A friend going out into the night to betray him. Another drawing a sword in anger. People going into hiding, 
running away naked in their eagerness to escape. In the midst of it all, Jesus said to those who had come to take him, I am he. And he said this so peacefully and so quietly that instead of him being nervous, it was they who trembled and fell backwards. This was an experience that has been repeated in the martyrs over every age. They could be tortured or burned, but because they possessed his peace, the onlookers could only wonder at their dignity and composure. It is no surprise to us, therefore, that Paul describes this peace as beyond understanding. How striking is the contrast Jesus draws between in the world where we are to have tribulation and in me where we may have peace. If God has placed us in the one to be thronged by its pressures and claims and needs, he has placed us also in the other to be held by him undisturbed amidst it all. Jesus himself once asked, who touched me? Mark 5 verse 30. The believing touch of one in that Capernaum multitude registered with him. It matched his own heart of compassion, whereas the pressure of the rest crowding upon him had no such effect. All their impatient jostling did not touch him in the least, for there was little in common between them and him. He said, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. If our life is the life of men, we are swayed by the world. If it is the life of the Spirit, however, it is unmoved by worldly pressures. Again, Paul reminds us righteousness, peace, and joy. These are the things the kingdom of God is concerned. Never let us be drawn away, therefore, into the old realm of eating and drinking. For it is neither the prescription of these things nor their prohibition that concerns us, but another world altogether. So we who are of the kingdom need not abstain. We overcome the world, not by giving up the world's things, but by being otherworldly in a positive way. By possessing, that is, a love and a joy and a peace that the world cannot give and that men sorely need. Far from seeking to avoid the world, we need to see how privileged we are to have been placed there by God. Let me repeat that. Far from seeking to avoid the world in which we live, we need rather to see how privileged we are to have been placed in this world by God to be lights. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 18, As thou didst send me into the world, even so send I them into the world. What a statement. The church is Jesus' successor, a divine settlement planted here right in the midst of Satan's territory. It is something that Satan cannot abide any more than he could abide Jesus himself. And yet it is something that he cannot by any means rid himself of. It is a colony of heaven, an alien intrusion on his territory, and one against which he is utterly powerless. Hallelujah. Children of God, Paul calls us, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you are seen as lights in the world. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. God has deliberately placed us in the cosmos to show it up for what it is. We are to expose the divine light for all men to see the world's God-defying rebelliousness on the one hand and its hollowness and emptiness on the other. And our task does not stop there. We are to proclaim to men the good news that if they will turn to the light, that that light of God in the face of Jesus Christ will set them free from the world's vain emptiness into the fullness that belongs to him. 
It is this twofold mission of the church that accounts for Satan's hatred. There is nothing that goads him so much as the church's presence in the world. Nothing would please him more than to see its telltale light removed. The church is a thorn in the side of God's adversary, a constant source of irritation and annoyance to him. We make a heap of trouble for Satan simply by being in the world. So why leave it? Jesus said in Mark 16 verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. This is the Christian's privilege. It is also his duty. Those who try to opt out of the world only demonstrate that they are still to some degree in bondage to its ways of thinking. We who are not of it have no reason at all to try to leave it, for it is where we should be. So there is no need for us to give up our secular employments far from it, for they are our mission field. Let me read that again. There is no need for us to give up our secular employments far from it, for these are our mission fields. In this matter, there are no secular considerations, only spiritual ones. We do not live our lives in separate compartments as Christians in the church and as secular beings the rest of the time. There is not a thing in our profession or in our employment that God intends should be associated from our life as his children. Everything we do, be it in the field or highway, in shop, factory, kitchen, hospital, or school, has spiritual value in terms of the kingdom of Christ. Everything is to be claimed for him. Satan would much prefer to have no Christians in any of these places, for they are decidedly in his way there. He tries, therefore, to frighten us out of the world. And if he cannot do that, then he wants to get us involved in his world system, thinking in its terms, regulating our behavior by its standards. Either would be a triumph for him. But for us to be in the world, yet with all our hopes, all our interests, and all our prospects out of the world, that is Satan's defeat and God's glory. Of Jesus' presence in the world, it is written that the darkness overcame it not. John chapter 1 verse 5. Nowhere in scripture does it tell us concerning sin that we are to overcome it, but it distinctly says we are to overcome the world. In relation to sin, God's word speaks only of deliverance. It is in relation to the world that it speaks of victory. We need deliverance from sin because God never intended we should have any touch with it. But we do not need nor should we seek deliverance from the world. For it is in the purpose of God that we touch it. We are not delivered out of the world but being born from above, we have victory over it, hallelujah. And we have that same victory in the same sense and with the same unfailing certainty that light overcame darkness. This is the victory that has overcome the world, John said, even our faith. And who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. The key to victory is always our faith relationship with the victorious Son. Be of good cheer, Jesus said. I have overcome the world. Again, John 16, verse 33. Only Jesus could make such a claim. And he could do so because he could earlier affirm, The prince of the world hath nothing in me. John 14, 30. It was the first time that anyone on earth had said such a thing. He said it, and he overcame. And through his overcoming, the prince of the world was cast out, and Jesus began to draw men to himself. 
And because he said it, we now dare say it too. Because of my new birth, because whatsoever is begotten of God overcomes the world, I can be in the same world my Lord was in, and in the same sense as he was. We, as the people of God, can be utterly apart from the world, yet a lamp set on a lampstand, giving light to all who enter the house. As he is, so are we in this world. 1 John 4, 17. You see, the church glorifies God not by getting out of the world, but by radiating the light of Jesus in the world in which we live. Heaven is not the place to glorify God. It will be the place to praise him. The place to glorify God is here in this dark world in which we live. And I can only say hallelujah, friends. What a great word from Watchman Nee, and even more so from the Holy Spirit who inspired Watchman Nee to give us these words. And what a challenge for us as the people of God to find that balance in separating ourselves from the things of the world to live above the world, to be the lights that Jesus has called us to be, yet to be in the world in which we live radiating that very light. And may he, the Holy Spirit, may the Lord Jesus and the Father give us the wisdom, the power, the courage, and the victory to know the difference and to learn how to walk in that fine balance, being in the world, but not of the world. Well, may the Lord Jesus continue to bless you in your journey. And until we meet again, I truly love you, friends, and I'll see you on the next video.